Cloud Native GRC, pretty uh, exciting title. Um, kind of the, what we're gonna talk to is a, a mesh of what all of that means and um, hopefully make this a little bit more exciting with a, a live demo in between and I'd say starting off with more of the, uh, the pros for what it is we wanna cover and the, the details and then jumping a little bit more to like the technical aspects, like what could we meaningfully do, what are we meaningfully do and honestly what do we still need to do um, so to kick it off, uh, I'm Brian Keller. I'm an open source maintainer at Defense Unicorns, uh, cloud native ambassador, um, and contributor to a couple of different uh, open source projects. Awesome, thanks. And I'm John Ziola. I am the co-founder of a company called Zenable, where we are trying to make governance better for everybody as a SaaS company. I also own a security consulting organization where we help tech companies uh, implement security and stay compliant uh, without a bunch of friction. So I'm also a CNCF ambassador, among other things. So I wanted to start things off with a little bit of a story. And like I said, I have spent the last seven years of my life consulting with tech companies and seeing some really egregious examples of what doing GRC looks like in mid-sized and larger tech companies. And the one example that I wanted to share is the one that really sticks out in my mind. I was talking with a company once and uh, we're talking about what their problems were, why would they even want to have, have some help? And they said, oh yeah, we, uh, we, we have to do, I forget what it was, I think it was maybe FedRAMP or something like that, one of those very prescriptive frameworks. And they said, oh yeah, we've got a team of people, it's our GRC team, we've actually got multiple teams, but this one team, uh, I was just wondering if we could you know, make things a little bit better for them. There's eight people on this team and their job all day long for the entire year is to go log in to different systems, take the login page, take a screenshot of the login page, and stash a picture of the screenshot of the login page in a folder as evidence to prove the operating system and the little dialog box that says, you're, don't, you're not a bad guy, you know, don't do anything bad on this system. And I was like, what? So that's like a job duty. That's like one of many job duties. That, no, 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 this is their entire job. Eight. FTEs, full-time employees, simply taking screenshots of logging pages for their entire job at this company. And I, I kind of put my head in my hands. I'm like, we, I, we need to do better. <laughs> this cannot be the situation that we're still in today. And this conversation was less than a year ago. Uh, and so that's, a, that's like a part of my motivation. I feel uh, uh, very intently focused on reducing toil in governance, risk, compliance, because we still have things like that in the world. We still have scenarios where there's entire people's jobs, teams of people manually doing this kind of undifferentiated uh, work, repetitive work, things that systems are very good at uh, that you could likely write a script and, uh, and replace and move those people to more meaningful work. All right. So that's, that's kind of my, my why. Uh, that, that's why I, I work in this space, is hearing those stories. But I also I wanted to talk briefly about Governance, right? So GRC, governance, risk, and compliance. Uh, you often start with, with governance. And so what is governance? Governance is a distillation of your company's requirements into a set of rules that you then follow, right? You create things like policies and standards and you follow those. You write down procedures and hopefully you can automate some of these things and you've got a mix of manual processes and automated processes to, to perform that. And if you need to be compliant with a different framework or regulations, you distill that, you simplify that into your governance. Another quick story, I once was working with a CISO and they said, uh, we were working with a, a set of developers and the developer said, hey, I'd, I'd like to do the right thing. I wanna make sure that this thing is secure. I just don't know exactly what that means. Uh, and so I'm asking security team, can you please help me define security? Here's some specific context about what's going on. And before I could say anything, the CISO says, oh, no, the, yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for reaching out. Um, but if you could just, we, I have one prerequisite for this meeting. If you could just go read NIST 853 and just make sure that you understand NIST 853 and then we'll come back and we'll have this conversation again because those are the rules. That's what you have to follow. And again, I about fell out of my chair. I'm like, what, what, what is going on right now? You can't expect, the, you can't expect a developer or really anyone, I, I barely read 853. I'm not even sure if I've read it all contiguously either, right? That's kind of an insane thing to ask. So we make governance to replace things like 853 and distill it down to exactly what your organization needs. 
And then we need to take from that governance, from those set of rules, we need to turn that into automation and evidence, automated evidence collection to prove that you are following the rules that you say that you'd like to. So you have these compliance requirements, uh, you distill those into governance, these documents, and then you bury your team in paperwork, <laughs> right? You make these 100 page, 200 page documents very common because you've put everything in them, everything that you could possibly ever want into this governance, and you bury your company in paperwork. <clears throat> I gave a completely separate talk on why your governance is probably broken. That's a QR code for it. You're welcome to listen to my rant on the 10 top reasons why your governance is probably broken. But the bottom line is we bury people in paperwork when we approach things that way. And so what do they do in response? Well, whenever we ask them to review and sign those policies, those standards, those procedures, it looks a little something like this. I, I stole this from Troy Fine. I don't know if you know Troy. Uh, he's a Pittsburgh native, which is where I'm from and pretty big on LinkedIn. I, I love his memes. Anyways, yeah, employee, these are the employees uh, doing their annual sign-offs of your policy, not reading a single thing, and great. So now we've just put all this time and effort into making governance, and literally nobody's reading it, nobody's using it, and if they ask us, we point them to 853, that whole process is broken, right? That is, that is absolutely not going to work. So let's flip things around. What is cloud-native GRC? Well, really, what are the attributes of cloud-native GRC? Well, first of all, we want to be able to provide assurance of what we're doing, of the security practices that we're following, but we want to use the typical observability characteristics, tools that our development teams, uh, that our SREs, et cetera, are already using, right? We want to do assurance via observability. We want to think of this as improving the quality of our overall system. I feel pretty strongly that security is a subset of observability and quality. And we want to do this in a heavily automated way with tight feedback loops, right? Some of the things that we've learned, I mean, this is Agile 101. We want to have tight feedback loops. We want to ship lots of small changes and iterate. What do we actually do in GRC? Well, for the most part, at best, you do a one-year giant revision of your document. You might do a couple training sessions, and it's a mess. You, again, you bury people in paperwork, and they just kind of like stamp through it. So these are kind of like the attributes of cloud-native GRC. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Brant here to talk and maybe define these terms a little bit more and, and give a bit of a demo. Yeah, so first thing you notice about my slides coming up, uh, my, creati my creativity score is off the charts in that it's less than zero. Um, and so I'm gonna break down like parts of cloud native, parts of GRC, combine them together. What is the mesh? What are we working on? Um, what do we do in open source for those who wanna get involved? Um, are all things that we're gonna come back to. But cloud native, right? Set the, set the foundation of cloud native and GRC. Uh, I think there's, some, there's a definition defined by the CNCF TOC if you wanted to check it out. Uh, but the really the things that stood out to me that mesh well with GRC is that it needs to be programmatic and repeatable. Um, those things, as soon as I saw them, I was like, yes, like those are the things we need to key on. Those are the key aspects of how we're using cloud native. We're using it in an abundance of different ways. We have applications that serve various different purposes and they accomplish different mission sets. Um, and we really wanted to key into that and then combine that with GRC, um, giant robot clubs, right? Uh, just kidding. Um, what we wanted to combine it with, with what John has set the stage for is governance, risk management, and compliance. Um, these are frameworks, John talked to them already about like why they matter within enterprise organizations, any organization um, generically. Uh, but we think about how, like what does GRC mean to each individual from a developer on software, from somebody with a security background, a compliance background, whatever the backgrounds of you know, many individuals within a company that all kind of, I would say, are covered by a company's GRC framework or implementation. Um, we, need, we need these things to mesh. We need them to be non-invasive at the end of the day. Uh, we need them to matter. We can't just be signing off and not actually reading what it means. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of the things that are covered by GRC that could be improved, right? Um, we're not saying there's any, uh, I would say, hopefully, malintent with the way that things are implemented today, but there's room for improvement. And where there's room for improvement, I think, is where we need to like, start to ask ourselves some of the questions. Like, is our GRC, and our can be a variety of different things. Um, 
in the CNCF open source projects, what do they do for GRC? Uh, what services do they provide? Um, and I think are, we need to be asking ourselves, like, as cloud native has become, you know, exploded and become very versatile across many different env environments, on-prem, cloud, et cetera, um, we've used them, we've, in, you know, benefited from them, but has GRC, has security, has compliance, has risk management evolved alongside them at the same pace? I'd largely argue no. Um, and so we need to be asking ourselves these questions as opposed to developing um, solutions that uh, are far more advanced than those with which the regulatory standards are uh, being applied against them. Um, so when we think about GRC, I wanted to point out like some of the barriers to entry if we, we think about things. Uh, and I don't mean these as a negatives, right? Enterprise, enterprise platforms are great. Um, they serve a great purpose. Um, they are not all inclusive. Not everybody has the ability to purchase or use an enterprise solution for the sake of their organization, nonprofit organizations, et cetera. Um, so they're not entirely accessible. Uh, there is a, I would say, an underlying push that we should have in open source, which is the underlying data format. Um, if you are doing all of your GRC and the technologies with which underneath your umbrella of GRC evolve, um, is that platform evolving alongside it? And if not, you would want to evaluate other options. And if you can't get your data out of that, you are locked into that platform. And vendor lock is, is a problem. Um, and I think variety of uh, different use cases there, but I'm a, I don't know, transparently a, a non-believer in vendor lock. Um, and so we think about then, okay, well, what, do you, what are your other options? You have open source, you have free software, um, they have disparate feature sets, and you know, I don't. Again, I don't see that as a negative. A tool solves this problem, and that's what a tool should do. Uh, it's not a platform, um, but they offer different feature sets. They offer different data formats. How do you exchange data? How do you ensure that you can map one piece all the way to the other end, and you know, create a larger picture that solves real problems for security and compliance um, and GRC across the board. Um, and so we want to we want to kind of hit where are we? Um, I'm kind of reading here because the notes didn't come up very well for me. Uh, but I think there's um, a couple different feature sets. One guardrails. So we have, thank you. Uh, we have things like um, cloud native applications that provide us with, I'd say, capabilities, admission control, uh, or policy that allows things or denies things and sets in stone like what can you do and if you don't meet the minimum requirements, wonderful, uh, you know, it's blocking things that should not happen. And I see those are great capabilities. The tooling implements those capabilities and so you could have tooling that provides GRC functions and I think there are a variety out there for solving your various needs. Um, but then there could also be tooling that we see heavily in the, you know, cloud native landscape um, that provide for how you meet compliance, how you meet you know, regulatory compliance. Um, and these could be things like in, riff, we're gonna riff off of um, the keynote from yesterday um, from Lynn Sun where um, she talked to MTLS and encryption, right? Those things at the end of the day serve a function. They serve for meeting the intent of a regulatory con con control that uh, comprises encryption. Um, and then we go to open standards, and this is kind of where I talk to uh, the, the idea of the data exchange format. How are we exchanging data? What is the underlying data format for which you are putting your data into underlying platforms, and is it portable? Is it accessible? Um, and is it uh, exchangeable in such a way that you can have a meaningful impact on you know, system integration and solving the whole of your problems for GRC? Um, so, Transparently, uh, I work on a tool called Lula, open source, um, and I'm less gonna talk about what it does. I'll show that in the demo, but more so like why did we come to the need to build yet another tool, right? Why yet another tool? And I think um, this is a, a story where like there should be commonalities or ties between various different things. Like, you know, 
there was a problem out there and we wanted to solve for it. And so for Lula, one of the problems was GRC and compliance. We have these controls. Um, how can we repeatedly measure them? I don't want people logging into a system and taking screenshots for things that we can programmatically collect data for and then measure the adherence of that data. If we can do that, then it's repeatable. If it takes screenshots and putting that in a folder somewhere, uh, technically, yes, the task is repeatable, but it requires human effort. And um, I think there's a, a certain threshold with which that crosses um, that makes that also not programmatic in nature. Um, but also then you th gotta think about some of the personas involved. Expectations and resistance are really important here. What are the personas doing today? They are putting screenshots in folders. What could they be doing instead? And rather than a function of something you can make programmatic and repeatable, we can focus on the things that aren't solved today to be programmatic and repeatable. Maybe there is still admin and other policy checks for compliance that you can't automate just yet. Um, those are problems that we need to solve um, but we need to meet those personas so that we can solve for the 70% of the programmatic and focus on the 30% that is not programmatic or repeatable today. And so one of those things that we saw was, okay, well, if all of my data goes into spreadsheets uh, and uh, I have no structure to the data, it's very hard to make things um, programmatic and repeatable. We looked for open standards. OSCAL was one of them, the NIST Open Security Controls Assessment Language. Um, and what that provided us was, was a foundation. Wonderful. We have something to work with where you're putting your control information in a machine readable format so that it is exchangeable, right? Uh, is repeatable um, and it is something with which has structure and that makes it, a, in my opinion, just a lot easier to work with. Um, and once we did that, we started seeing, okay, well, what can we do here? We can collect large bodies of evidence. It doesn't solve your GRC problems end to end, uh, but once we have that, What's step two? Well, we had a problem with looking at Kubernetes clusters for adherence of um, compliance against any given standard, 853, um, and doing the mapping. And so, okay, well, let's try and solve for that. And so um, what I'm gonna show in the demo, actually, I think next, uh, or just about next, um, or is next, is, uh, is kind of that structure. It's one opinionated way, it's a disparate feature set, right? Like I called out earlier, it's not perfect. Um, but it is, I think, you know, starting to say, like, can we cast the vote for the future where all of our data is in an exchangeable, repeatable format, uh, machine readable. We can make it human friendly readable. Um, and if your enterprise solution platform, et cetera, accepts that, then wonderful. Like it makes everyone's lives that much easier. If it can output and then tools could uh, whether open source or not, could go and operate on them, wonderful. Like, we're creating this uh, exchangeable format so that we can solve problems end to end instead of here's the boundary, we, we collect the data and we throw the, the data over the boundary. So demo. Um, set this up really quickly. I'm gonna mirror, wonderful. What you're gonna see, again, this is fully transparent, not gonna, it's gonna be a bunch of text. This is the underlying engine for Lula and what we're trying to solve for making this process programmatic and repeatable. Um, some of the key aspects of that is one, this text here, which is slightly washed out by the lights, is showing um, the OSCAL format for a component. It's just saying like, in the scenario, I have these controls that apply to this component of the system. Uh, this is the service mesh um, component, and so it has controls that apply to it, AC4 from 853, um, a variety of different controls that apply to it. Wonderful. Now we have data in a structured format. It doesn't do anything by itself, like it's just the data format. Um, but then what's step two? And I think what step two is here is where um, Lula, the open source tool, comes in and we apply a link here that says, okay, well, we want to perform a validation. Um, for Lula, there are two main groups of data for this underlying structure. Um, first one is domain, and that's where do you collect your data. Within a proof, we have the idea of collecting data uh, in such a way that it's repeatable, but also then, once you have that data, apply it against policy and, and evaluate its adherence 
to that policy. So we have Kubernetes uh, domain here. We are getting all the pods across all of the cluster. Um, I'll show you that I'm connected to a cluster here in a second. And then we run it through a policy. This is for the OPA provider in Lula. Um, again, this is all statically compiled into a single CLI binary. Um, so you take your compliance as code, you take Lula the binary, and you can take this to any environment, any Kubernetes cluster and evaluate it. Is Istio installed there? No. Well, okay, well, these controls are going to fail. Um, but if it is, then we can start to do checks. And so um, at the keynote yesterday, um, it was demoed for MTLS encryption. You can do that in a variety of different ways. Let's make a repeatable and programmatic validation for how you can evaluate MTLS encryption so we can detect when it's doing it right and when it's not. Um, so what you'll see here is one, we're gonna connect to a cluster that's running. I'm gonna try and make this a little bit more legible. If it'll let me, no, okay, cool, dictionary. Um, let's just zoom out a little bit more. Uh, so you can see there's a cluster here. There's a variety of things running in the cluster. The thing that I wanna point out is we have Istio running and within that, um, with Istio running, we have a mission app in the mission namespace. It is deployed. If you know what you're looking for with sidecar um, injection with Istio, um, we are not using ambient mesh in this demo. Um, if you know what you're looking for, there is a, there is a separate sidecar container running inside this pod, so there's two of two there. Um, wonderful, so we have our mission app, we have our environment. Um, what we can do then is consume that component definition and output a results of our evaluation. And so I'll make that a little bit larger here so you can see the command. We validate against this live environment using that validation that I just showed for the policy and the data collection, wonderful. You'll see a, an output here that's talking to, we're running the validation, we evaluate it, it is satisfied. So what we have essentially said is we have evidence to support the fact that there is a control that is now satisfied um, using the OSCAL data format and the assessment results. You can see a variety of things. We evaluated these controls, wonderful. If there is no evidence to support a control being met, it's not satisfied. Again, this can be run against any OSCAL. It's not specific, it's not a specific flavor of OSCAL for Lula. Um, but we, what we do have here is evidence to support the fact that there is data we collected that gives us something that says that the control could be satisfied. And this is a, an and operation. You could put 10 validations. You wanna check every single configuration for MTLS uh, in your cluster to really drill down and make sure that things are um, running effectively. And so we have controls here, you see AC4 is in a satisfied state. Wonderful, repeatable, programmatic. Um, we can come back here and to the effect of running assessments, we can say, okay, well, I want to, I want to rerun this over and over again. I wanna do it day over day, I wanna do it hour by hour, minute by minute, doesn't matter. You inject those same, um, you use that same compliance as code and you use the same binary It'll run, um, you should get the same results, wonderful. The only other aspect to this is we have evaluate, and how do, you, how do you tell when something is worse, equal, or better? In the sense of Lula evaluate here, um, we're saying that the, the threshold has been met. Um, we're saying that it is as, as compliant as the previous run, or as compliant as the threshold. Um, and so the threshold is stating like, when is your best compliance? What is your best compliance state? You must be always that good. That's great. So we've, we've established that we are just as good as we were previously. What we can do now is we can add an image, we can add a pod to our cluster. Um, and so if you look at this really quickly, what you're going to see is I am explicitly removing this new pod from Istio injection. I'm saying Istio injection false. So what this is going to do is create a new pod. We will look at our cluster really quickly. Um, and what we'll see here is we have a new mission app drift. I don't want that. We have a new mission app drift in the mission namespace. Uh, it's a new pod that's running. Um, you need to deploy a new mission app. 
Maybe somebody did this purposefully, they removed it from the service mesh so that they could do X, Y, or Z and test it, or it could be malicious. Um, this is drift, right? As soon as you get the data for your assessments um, and you assess it for compliance, that data could be very well out of date. Somebody could have changed your environment, malicious or otherwise. Um, and that's not good. And so what we wanna do is rerun our compliance just as we did previously. This is the same command over and over again with the same inputs. What we will notice here is that we checked for compliance on that control, evaluated, it is now not satisfied. We could go into the results here. We could now see that there's a new result for not satisfied. Um, and what we want to check is like, are we worse for compliance now? There's something different. Um, and so we'll rerun that same evaluate command really quick. And we get notified. Something happened here. And what happened was we identified that we are less compliant than our threshold. Our threshold said you must at least be meeting this one control. It was satisfied previously and you are not anymore. And, and this is how, like in our pipeline development workflows, we add this compl these compliance checks to um, various packages such as the service mesh. Uh, and in doing so, we know when we are making a change that will affect dev test, stage, prod, et cetera, uh, in such a way that we are less compliant than we were previously, and the, again, the feedback loops that were we mentioned earlier. So we can delete that mission app really quick. Again, rerun, validate. We get our new assessments. Um, we now see satisfied. We now see satisfied. Wonderful. And then we evaluate. And now we're back to our state of compliance against the threshold. We are equally as compliant or, in this case, we are not more, but in the case where you are more compliant, we update the threshold. And that is the live demo. Let me switch back. Awesome. Thanks, Brant. Let's see, is this working? Great. Uh, okay, so that's one example of how you could uh, automate your GRC processes. We're gonna briefly do a survey of a bunch more. I'm not gonna go in a lot of detail because I think we have approximately two minutes <laughs> left if we wanna leave some time for questions. Uh, so let's quickly go through uh, a few other GRC processes that can be done with automation using open source tools. Uh, of course, there's a whole bunch of different options in the CNCF. If you're not familiar with the landscape page, landscape.cncf.io, I have a link to it at the bottom. You can uh, see all of the projects that have to do with security in this kind of ecosystem that we're talking about, but there's also many other features in other tools outside of this that also can provide those controls those control requirements. Uh, you might also want to use a tool like ConfTest. This comes from the OPA project. If you want to, in this case, we're assessing a Docker file and we're ensuring that the Docker file from the parent image or the base image is not in the uh, deny list. In this case, we're deny listing Nginx. And so you could run this only given source code just with passing a Docker file in and, and gluing it together with ConfTest. If you've already built the image and you want to assess the outcome of that, there's another great tool called GOSS, and there are these wrappers for things like Docker, which is DGOSS, uh, Kubernetes, KGOSS, et cetera, uh, even uh, Docker Compose with DCGOSS. And in this case, you define a YAML file which says these are the attributes that I need in the post-build artifact in the that OCI image, uh, as well as at, when it's running, you know, you need to have processes running or listening on a given port or configured in a uh, given way. So uh, ConfTest, great for pre-build step, and then after you build it, you can assess things with GOSS. Similarly, with infrastructure as code, if you want to assess things while that, uh, you know, to open Tofu or Terraform projects, those TF files are in your repository, you could run a tool like Checkoff. This is an example of a vulnerable Terraform and whenever you run an assessment, again, it's with checkoff, you find a bunch of findings, right? Again, we're saying that some things are good, the top three, I believe, are good, and then the bottom one is a problem, and it points out specifically the line of code that is an issue. Again, just another open source tool for assessing, in this case, infrastructure as code. 
Now, uh, again, if you have deployed that infrastructure as code already and you want to assess things that are running in your environment, another great tool is from the Chef ecosystem, which is InSpec. And in this case, I have a few different example uh, InSpec policies that do things like configure or ensure the configuration of your SSH, uh, SSHD. So you can see here we have SSHD config. We've got um, user ownership attributes, uh, permissions, et cetera, that it exists. But you can do more than that, so you can ensure a certain list of ciphers. You can say at least, or it includes this list, or it's exactly this list. Whatever your policies, your requirements are, you can assess this, and you can assess it both on source code and repositories in runtime. That's kind of the main thing that I'm trying to, to demonstrate here briefly. Uh, you can also say that we want to avoid password-based policies. We're only going to allow keys or something along those lines. Now, in your environments, you might not know exactly where to start. It's great that we have all of these tools to perform assessments, but how do you know where to start? In Tag Security, we've provided a bunch of different white papers, and in the Controls Catalog initiative, uh, which uh, I led, I, I, I did a little bit of a write-up on the blog. This is also in the Tag Security repo. We distilled those multiple big PDF documents and markdown documents into list of controls, essentially recommendations that we made in those white papers, and to simplify it down. And so if you wanted to say, I want to ensure I'm following the recommendations from a tag security white paper, you could go to these uh, documents and get essentially a bulleted list of items, and then you could assess yourself against those controls using any of the other tools that we talked about or more. Yeah, question? For, like, uh, for OpenStack, mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure specifically to like how you'd be able to consume that with uh, OpenSCAP, but uh, conceptually the... Uh, it's got a nasty XML diagram that basically says, you know, these are like this control is basically for you know, 800.171. Yeah. 333, yeah, so you're talking to... You're describing like a crosswalk or a cross mapping, right? Exactly. So uh, as a part of this initiative, we did cross map things to 853 because we thought that if you needed to map through that to some other framework, that would be the easiest, um, most kind of detailed way to do it. Uh, I will caution, it's kind of best effort. So you may, there might be things missing. Uh, and so if you find anything that is missing, we accept PRs. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is, there is a mapping to 853 in there. We also bundle every time we make changes to that repository. Uh, it'll automatically generate OSCAL output, so every single commit from here on out, we have OSCAL outputs, so you can programmatically consume that as well. Um, that is currently in the repository listed at the bottom, but we are looking to fold this back in, maybe into a tag security repo. We're trying to figure out a, a long-term home for it. We have kind of a short-term home for it there. But we do have those OSCAL artifacts, and then there's other information, like a Google Sheet and uh, uh, things that are linked in the blog post. And uh, again, if you're trying to figure out what controls to choose, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of AI tools, and I would definitely recommend, this is just an example thing, I hacked on this like in an evening one night, I mean, it's a custom GPT in the OpenAI ChatGPT store uh, called Cloud Native Threat Modeling. What I did was I shoved a bunch of like uh, OWASP security uh, best practices and cheat sheets and the tag security white papers and pretty much everything that I could find, and I passed it in as context, and then I gave it a big long prompt that said, help me threat model, help me do risk assessments of my environment, and so, uh, you're welcome to use that. I have a URL shortener at the bottom because it's a really nasty URL. Also, everything to create this is open source. So if you go to that bottom link, you can see all of the source information. You can make your own GPT. You don't have to use mine. Um, it, and I also can't see if you use this, what information you put into it, anything like that. It's just uh, simply for uh, to, to get things started. It did. I did spend probably most of the time writing the prompt for this, uh, which was kind of interesting to push people down, to push it down the, the stride methodology, the open and secure white paper from Tag Security, which is how we do security assessments, is included in here and a bunch of other cool stuff. And I updated this the other day because I heard about the AI uh, white paper, the CNCF uh, AI white paper, and so I added that in there as well. And so now it's like all about the AI. It's telling me all kinds of stuff I need to be worried about, which is great. All right, so that's, that's pretty much the end of our primary content. We, but we wanted to say a little bit of, of now what. Right, so uh, where do we go from here? Well, first of all, if you hear people saying to your developers that they need to read 853 in order to know if they're meeting your security requirements, let's find ways to, to quash that. Let's, let's squash that um, and, and point things to more productive uh, conversations. 
Um, we want to automate everything, right? Remember going back to that cloud native GRC slide that I had earlier, we want to automate everything. We want to think of this as an observability and a quality problem, right? Uh, and we want to have tight feedback loops. So every time you are involved with GRC, how can we push kind of that, that sort of a focus? How do we emphasize these more modern practices? Uh, there's also a lot of work going on in the CNCF around things like this. Uh, and uh, tag security is one great way to, to get involved with that. We have numerous different projects and, and working groups inside of there uh, that are focusing on, on different areas. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other open source non-CNCF projects as well that I would definitely uh, recommend looking at. Uh, we've got a project called the Automated Governance Project, which we're trying to uh, get, kind of get moving again. Um, there's a working group on compliance. There's the controls catalog that I showed before. There's some additional work to be done there. Did I miss anything? No, nope, you got it. Okay, awesome. So what else you got? No, I think that covers it. I think really what we're trying to talk to is the non-invasive piece. A developer shouldn't need to read 853, so how are you going to solve for that gap with addressing developer updates, changes, major revisions, et cetera, uh, and you know, kind of like ease the workflow. You still need a threshold at the end of the day Something that says, like, here's the minimum requirement for meeting this, and we need to continue to meet that. Uh, but then, like, what does the future look like? And uh, really what we need to be striving for is, like, a state of continuous compliance. Um, automated governance, I think, uh, both in some of the, uh, I, I don't want to say older, but some of the white papers that were released uh, a couple years ago, as well as the uh, automated governance initiative that we're working on right now, really starts to egg out, like, okay, well, if we are making changes, what's, what's uh, evaluate compliance on commit? And I think that's a great way to, to check for compliance state, um, but also you know, continuous compli compliance of your environment. Uh, the more strict or uh, I would say regulated your environment is, the more adherence that you should have with being continuously compliant um, and finding ways to do that. And uh, there may be solutions that exist there today, but I'd say that's largely a solution space that it's not been solved for. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with that, we'll take any questions you'll have. Thanks. I mean, uh, solving for that generically is gonna probably be pretty broad. Uh, we probably need to approach what we have for uh, optionality in the machine readable space first and foremost and say, how do we get that format in something that we can have structured and uh, operate with and then the personas to get involved here uh, so that we don't make assumptions along the way. Uh, that's probably the biggest piece and probably the biggest piece that I still like want to find the right people to get involved with the projects that I work on um, so that we don't make assumptions about what we're trying to do. Rather, we have somebody who says, this is what needs to happen. Uh, and those personas are the ones that, again, we want to bring into this community and get involved. Uh, so largely, I have a non-answer for you, which is <laughs> there still sounds like a lot of work to be done there. And uh, we need experts in that space to help us maybe bridge that gap. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that having uh, machine readable formats that understand that sort of a format, like uh, I think as you already know, but some others may not, uh, OSCAL is a very controls-based language, and so it doesn't take into account impact and likelihood and things like risk, uh, but I think that it should, personally. Or I think that we should have a uh, machine readable format that does take that into account and can calculate things like residual risk after controls have been applied and, and really uh, just handle more risk-based frameworks than prescriptive frameworks like your FedRAMPs and you know 800 53 and, and things like that. I think we need both sides of the fence. Uh, so I would say largely the, the whole workflow should be something repeatable. Um, and so the tool doesn't um, have any prescribed like standard that's going in. So if you're using 853, wonderful, like you would attribute the controls that apply to that component. That was the service mesh component. Only these select controls apply to that component. Uh, but the idea with, the, with OSCAL and the component definition model would be start comprising your system in many components. Um, and so if you had a component that did meet those controls and then you wanted to write validations that could go and check for those programmatic things, either API endpoints, Kubernetes configuration, cloud configuration, um, those are all capabilities we want to support. We don't maybe support all of those out of the gate. But um, I think there's generally this idea that um, we, with or without the assessment automation, we still really want people to start to look at the machine readable action first. If you're capturing your controls in a machine readable format, I, I would say you're casting a vote for the future where you can uh, digest your compliance and the state of your compliance much quicker than a human can read 
through something like a spreadsheet, for example. And then once you have that information, you start to augment it. And augmenting is where we do the assessment automation and say, yes, there is data that I can go collect programmatically and repeatedly. Uh, and we're going to start to inject that into our compliance checks. All right, any other questions? Cool. Before we wrap up, I have one request for you all. Um, if you could just smile and say cheese and wave for my kids. Cheese. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, hope you enjoyed the conference. This is the last one of the day, so thank you all.